ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the national anthem. Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha, Dravida, Uttala, Vanga, Vindya, Himachal, Yamuna, Ganga, Uchala, Jaladhi, Taranga, Tava, Shubha, Name, Jage, Tava, Shubha, Aashish, Maage, Gahe Tava Jaya Gatha Jana Gana Mangala Dayak Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vidhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He Good morning. As climate change manifests itself through a prolonged monsoon, a very warm welcome to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to our respected speaker, Advocate J. Sai Deepak. And continuing our tradition, I will request Madan Vajpayee of Pravodhan Manch to welcome our speaker with a shawl, a shrifa, and a book. Friends, thanks to all of you, the family of Prabodhan Mancha is growing by leaps and bounds. 15,000 plus YouTube subscribers, 2,700 registered audience, 250 contributors of whom 75 have made a repeat contribution. Frankly, it's very overwhelming. WhatsApp has proven to be a very effective tool for communicating with all of you. So while we try and make sure that our response times are better, we also request you to update and store our WhatsApp number. But just remember it's for text only and no voice calls. <laughs> we have a very special relationship with today's speaker. He's the first one to grace the podium a third time for Prabodhan Mancha. In his first talk, which was end 2018, I remember we took a few minutes to introduce him. Next, he was here with us in mid-2020 online, and I think I took a minute and a half. Today, with an audience of 1,000 plus and many more coming in, he does not need an introduction. As India, that is Bharat, enters its Amrit Kal as a civil society, the one document that governs every aspect of our life is our constitution. While much is written and documented about the process of its creation, it is very important to understand the ethos and the psyche that went and shaped it. What went into writing the world's lengthiest constitution for a sovereign country? Was it the three plus years of the Constituent Assembly, the preceding versions of 1935 or 1919, or is it a much longer history that shaped it? And who better than Sai Deepak Ji to speak on this? Based on the feedback that you, our audience, have given us, just a clarification. With such a large audience in a packed house, we are inundated with questions for our speakers. Our team, it is sitting here, 
they weed out those questions for taking out what is relevant they wean out the repetitions they widen the coverage and group them into some sort of categories but in doing so uh, some of the audience may feel that their questions haven't been put up to the speaker and apologies for that i hope you're still happy with the process that we have so like always if you do have a question do pass it on to our volunteers who are in the aisles and we will try and address it during the q and a over to you saidipuk ji namaste thanks to prabodhan manch for hosting me for the third time i would have loved to come here for the second uh, time i think in 2020 as part of the book tour but the lockdown played truant and uh, otherwise i would have actually wanted to discuss the first book here this time i have decided to actually fuse the contents of the first and the second books to present perhaps a much more comprehensive picture because whatever preconceived notions that i had during the course of the writing of the first book uh were busted as i kept reading and as i've said on at least two or three podcasts and even during the course of the launch event in delhi that i experienced a certain creative epiphany so to speak during the course of the writing of the second book which almost changed the course of the entire scope that i wish to cover as part of the next two books so it's no more a trilogy it's no more a tri it will be a tetralogy or a quadrilogy and the reason for this is that the material that we have collected for this crucial period until 1950 needs to be done justice to so the original intended scope of the trilogy as was mentioned in the introduction of the first book was from 1492 to 1919 would have been the first book which it was 1920 to 1951 would have been the second book and 52 that is from the first general elections to the end of emergency in 1977 would have been the third book now during the course of writing which i typically start around vijayadashmi in october i started it last year and uh, for close to two months i wasn't able to make headway beyond 1747 words and as someone who prides in his ability to write quickly uh i have typically uh, an industrial engineer's approach to writing which is 16000 to 20000 words has to be gotten out under any circumstances i couldn't complete more than 1800 words in 2 months and i was fairly be- uh, behind schedule and the launch date for this book was supposed to be in early august 11th of august and uh, the pre-release was supposed to happen in july the pre-release was advanced but the actual release was delayed by about 12 days i think from 23rd of august because sometime in january or maybe earlier than that i was asking myself if there is a reason why i am not able to move forward and as someone who certainly has a lot of uh, faith in science from everywhere and i don't see anything as coincidence at least in my limited life on this planet i have seen that there is no such thing as coincidence every opportunity that lands on your table is the is the product of prarabdha as we see it one way or the other and therefore it's up to you to make the most of it so i wanted to understand why is it that i wasn't able to make any headway despite having a mountain of material to do justice to and i then realized that i was rushing through certain critical portions of bharatiya history which needed to be dealt with in a certain degree of detail because the parallels that could be drawn between that particular period and what we are currently witnessing were uncanny and to miss out on that and the valuable lessons that the mistakes of the period had to offer to the current generation i thought would be a lost opportunity when you're sitting on a pile of research material and therefore i decided to rework the timelines completely and fortunately the publisher was on board they had full faith in the vision of the book uh, as well as the the follow up so to speak and so i reworked it to a period which starts with the decline of the mughal empire in 1740 and proceeds to the end of the khilafat movement or at least the supposed popular end of the movement in december 1924 
and by the time i was done with this book i wanted to finish this book around end of april may once the the scope was clear because the material was anyway there this much i realized that this was no more an academic exercise which i mentioned in pune last evening as well and that the sense of urgency with which the content of this book had to be gotten out had taken over me completely so much so that uh, despite my practice commitments and other commitments literally i was sleepless because the circumstances that led to the khilafat and subsequently paved the way to the partition of the sacred geography called bharat and their parallels with the present were so obvious that the only question left to be answered was is bharat again moving towards another vibhajan and i hope i am not casting out any negative energy by spelling out this possibility i genuinely hope that all of us work towards preventing it under any circumstances i genuinely hope it never enters the realm of probability and eventuality and therefore i kept writing and writing and writing i got stuck in the eighth chapter seriously because that chapter alone was over 52000 words and uh, at one point the material was eating into my sleep for the simple reason that it was fairly painful to read painful from the perspective of of course the riots that were taking place but what was even more painful was the ostrich like mindset of this community as well as the society at large and its inability to actually call a spade and have a clear picture of a threat perception which is to say perhaps the object of the first book was to present a conceptual template in terms of finding the underpinnings of the problem but the second book is perhaps better defined as an exercise in identification of shatrubodh which i think is sorely missing as far as the hindu community is concerned now obviously the use of the word shatrubodh is bound to ruffle a few feathers it's bound to make people squirm in their seats because that means there is a shatru which you do not wish to acknowledge and therefore the use of the word enemy is politically incorrect today because no you see communal harmony national integration and what not so the idea was to move beyond those platitudes and to be able to at least present facts and the more i read now i loop back to the topic this much was clear that i will never ever be natmastak before the constitution i will not approach it with a sense of religiosity i will not treat the veda and the constitution at par with each other under any circumstances because the document is the product of multiple compromises and political decisions it is not worthy i'm not saying it's not worthy of respect i'm simply saying it's not worthy of the religious fervor that you wish to associate with it that should never happen because then in the process i think your sandarsh is completely screwed up your ability to see things for what they are and objectivity is completely it takes it takes a back seat and the kind of compromises that we made in the course of drafting the precursors to the current constitution starting from let's say the 1919 act and thereafter every decision that was taken at a national level in terms of compromises on communal legislations compromises on communal veto clearly told me that the bhartiya society or perhaps the hindu society has accepted that its default mode is the mode of compromise and concession and that needed to be completely etched out of its dna not etched edged out of its dna so the the that particular dna even if it did not exist perhaps was given concrete shape to about a century before i was born which is in 1885 when the platform called the indian national congress was created to call members of the indian political union to congregate to discuss the future of this country the manner in which this particular creature was constituted it was not a political party it was meant to be a conference platform and what were the circumstances the surrounding circumstances which led to the creation of this particular entity by the british with available records clearly shrieking and screaming volumes to this particular effect and how do you expect the colonizers entity to actually bat for independence is a question that should have been posed right at the outset no wonder you were batting for the romanian status for the better part of your so called independence struggle 
were you asking for dominion status because it was an incremental move towards independence? No. The leading lights of this particular movement, if at all it can be called one with self-respect, were very clear that the only way Bharat can reform and move to the path of development and whatnot is by riding on the coattails of the empire. This was said as much. And those people who were asking for independence and complete independence were being branded lunatics by people like Gokhale. So the better part of this particular period is perhaps defined in a fantastic book by Stephen Colpert, which happens to be one of the referenced books that I've used to understand this period, who captures the clash of two titans, both of them Maharashtrian Brahmins, Gokhale and Tilak. Whenever possible, do read it. One was, I'm not accusing anyone of any particular intention. I'm simply judging them on the basis of their conduct because intention is difficult to decipher. The human mind, you can't really say what was going on in somebody's head. The only, mo uh, let's say, tangible proof that you have of somebody's intention is what they've done. So while hindsight bias is to be avoided, at the very least, you have hindsight to be clear about what they did. So the benefit of hindsight is available so that you don't repeat the same mistakes. The second thing that was very clear also, so Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal has spoken on this particular subject, even Vikram Sampath, uh, who's a good friend, has also spoken on this particular subject, is the neglected, marginalized aspect, almost ostracized aspect of the valiant, valorous contributions of the revolutionaries towards achieving independence. That material comes to the fore brilliantly. And how they were branded orthodox Hindus, Brahmin fascists, um, extremists, nationalists, what not. Nationalist was actually used as a cuss word by the way then. I'm not sure the situation has changed. <laughs> and the distinction between liberals and nationalists is not the product of the social media age. It was in vogue in the 1900s. You may know them as only Narandal and Garandal, but when it translated to English, it became liberals versus nationalists, moderates versus extremists. But the one thing that I've tried to present as a continuing thought through this entire journey is while you were busy being divided into camps, one which was a collaborative camp with the colonizer and the other which was fighting for the assertion of the native identity and its ethos, the other side was brilliantly uh, and in a very concerted fashion, it was reviving its ability to organize and capture political power after the loss of the Mughal Empire state power. So these days on social media, we are being constantly told by Chanakya Niti Pandits that political power is the be all and end all of the game. I disagree in a very qualified fashion. I am never going to rubbish the importance of political power, never. But to treat that as the sole variable in the entire calculus is to render the society a silent stakeholder, if at all there is such a thing, to the point of completely saying your existence does not matter except for once in five years. And therefore, how a particular society or a community can brilliantly organize itself around certain causes which are central to it and revive its ability to capture public space even after it has lost political space after the decline of the Mughal Empire, that is something that you need to be able to draw a leaf out of from their journey. So in uh, social media debates or even in prime time television debates these days, there's a very fundamentally stupid argument as to whether Syed Ahmed Khan must be seen as the father of two-nation theory or Sri Savarkar must be seen as the father of two-nation theory. Anybody who tries to answer that question is walking into a trap. It's a trick question. Neither of them is the father of the two-nation theory. The father of the two-nation theory was Shah Waliullah Delavi. 
and Syed Ahmed Khan merely was capturing that particular ideology which was crystallized in an English modern Europe Eurocentric medium. That's all he was doing and he was pushing that particular agenda because he was a direct product of the seminary run by Shah Waliullah Delavi. And how what you're, you're currently witnessing in terms of majority minority debates is fundamentally a restatement of the two nation theory and the inability of a particular group to accept that a Hindu majority state is back to power. That is the nub of the argument that is at the heart of this particular problem, nothing else. When Congress was batting for the introduction of parliamentary style democracy in Bharat, and there were people in the colonial parliament, in the British parliament, who were willing to consider that, with reservations of course. The proponents of two nation theory and the followers of Syed Ahmed Khan opposed it tooth and nail on the ground that a parliamentary democracy for Bharat would effectively translate to Hindu majority state power and therefore that can never be accepted. And from there started the argument of reservation of electorates for a particular community and the concept of communal electorates. And that is what ultimately moved in that particular direction in 1906. And therefore disproportionate representation in the parliament which has got nothing to do with the actual numerical strength of the community was the basis of the argument. It doesn't matter how many people we are, we will be judged on the basis of the fact that we are former rulers of Hindustan, we are landlords, we are nawabs and there's a certain political significance we are entitled to enjoy and therefore our representation in the parliament should not be based on our numbers. That was the argument. And this was the clear crystallized argument without even mincing words. I'm not paraphrasing even one bit. This is exactly what they said. In their letter to the Viceroy, this is exactly what they said, which is known as the Shimla Reputation of 1906. Now, because there is a constitution and because there is the guilt of partition, therefore, you would not want to talk about the two-nation theory. So, therefore, let's find politically acceptable sanitized labels for the very same thing and that becomes the majority-minority debate under independent Bharat. So, the fight is still on. One third is already gone, now let's fight for the two third. Because what was being sought was the entire Mughalistan, which is effectively the bulk of Bharat. So if you think, so I have some people in my close circles who say, Pakistan ko Kashmir dehi dete It's the end of the matter, that's all they want. Then you've really not understood what according to them is unfinished business. Assam is unfinished business. Hyderabad is unfinished business. Junagadh is unfinished business. All those places which relate to the Pakistani mentality are unfinished businesses, regardless of geography. If at all you wish to really make sense of this book, I would suggest that you read two other books along with this. One, I think you should certainly read, uh, despite my serious disagreements with Dr. Ambedkar, you should read Pakistan and the Partition of India. The thing about that particular book is that it's categorical and blunt, but there are portions of the book which also clearly say that the Dalits find more in common with the Muslims as opposed to Hindus. There are those portions of the book as well. Conveniently, we ignore those portions of the book because we want to use that book only to say that even Ambedkar believed that there had to be a population exchange. But you don't complete the entire sentence. Until 1946, Dr. Ambedkar was in alliance with two other people, Jinnah and Periyar. Periyar wanted a Dravid Nadu and effectively said, if the British leave, then the Brahmins will take over the state administration, so don't go. That was his position. I've, I've sown the seeds of that particular discussion in this book. I've captured it very clearly. And only when he realized that ultimately he was going to get secondary treatment if he were to go to Pakistan, his position started changing. And then is when the 1946 publication comes out, which is Pakistan of the Partition of India. The other book that you must read is Venkat Dhulipala's book, the creation of the new Medina, which is a fantastic book, but that book starts from 1937. Then the other suggestion would be Christine Fair's book on the Pakistan army's way of war, how it is a never ending war and what is the agenda and how it is fundamentally a military state which is pushing this particular unfinished business. And the imagery of the cover of the book is fantastic because there is, I think if, I, if my memory serves me right, which it usually does, is the Mughal uh, flag on the cover of the book with perhaps the, the, did the Mughal flag have the tiger or the lion? I think the lion. 
Tipu Sultan had tiger and perhaps this one had lion. Perhaps, yes. So that was clearly captured. And if you read all these together, you'll have to ask yourself, how are we so mired in our own illusions of some kind of mythical unity? And how that unity was strategic, convenient and collaborative for very clear ends comes out through the reading of this particular literature. And then you'll ask yourself, in light of this, with this historical experience, which was staring uh, in your face, did you draft the constitution with all of this in mind to protect the, the community which is the victim, the true victim? The other thing that I'm also trying to show through the book is kindly stop buying into this nonsense called that the partition of Bharat is the sole creation of the divide and rule policy of the British. It is utter BS. There is no basis for this whatsoever. The divide and rule policy did not create a division. It exploited an existing division that existed for a thousand years. So anybody who wants to wallow in this comfortable infantile juvenile notion, I am sorry to say, is subscribing to a history textbook of 7th standard. <laughs> and that too by NCERT, so don't subscribe to it. <laughs> at all. Those honeymoon phases of unity, how fraught they were with riots and how fragile it was becomes very, very clear once the purpose of the Khilafat movement is lost. Then they don't need Hindu support whatsoever because the purpose of the Khilafat movement was destroyed by a Muslim, Kemal Ataturk, who abolished the Khilafat, secularized his country, but of course that process I think is a failure now thanks to the person who thinks of himself as the revival or the reviver of the Khilafat, again Erdogan. So, when you see all of this, you realize that you are needed when you are needed and not beyond. And the justification for that unity was also given through a Quranic verse. And the person who was giving this particular justification, saying that this collaboration is Quranically justified and sanctified, was the first education minister of independent Bharat, Azad. How he was one of the leading proponents of the Khilafat is only half of the equation. The other half of the equation is one of the most virulent believers and proponents of the concept, the doctrinal concept of jihad. His writings reflect that over and over and over again, he was a hardcore Wahhabi. Who was the Manas Putra of Sayyid Jamaluddin Afghani, one of the foremost pan-Islamist thinkers of the 19th century who was single-handedly responsible for giving the Turkish or the Ottoman Caliphate a certain position of importance when Egypt had fallen and other countries had fallen. The Emir of Afghanistan was effectively rendered a notch curl of the British and then he realized that he needed external powers. So this person re-energized the Muslim population across the world and the people who learnt from him were members of Dioband. Firangi Mahal and Walan Azad. These connections are drawn in the book. At the outset, let me also say this at the, I mean, lest I'm seen as taking credit for all the literature and the research. This literature has existed in the public domain, obviously. What I have done is to bring them all together using the skill set of a lawyer in terms of marshalling evidence to say this is what the evidence says. There have, in fact, uh, Sri R.C. Majumdar has captured this in some detail. Then Sri H.K. Seshadri has captured it in some detail. There are fantastic books capturing the journey of the Aligarh movement by M.S. Jain. But put, to put it all together is where I think my original contribution lies. And I can say this without being immodest or modest because this is a factual statement. So this much I'm very confident of in terms of the fundamental building blocks or the foundation on which the book rests. It's solid, solid literature. It has close to 1400 references. I'm very clear about what I've done here. So factually, at the very least, I can't be countered. Let's see what happens to logic after that. The point I'm trying to make is 
Finally, I, uh, perhaps this is going to be my late motive in all the book talks. This is no more an academic exercise. I'm not in the business of motivational speaking. I'm a serious practitioner of the law. I'm trying to take time out only to perhaps help the community understand what I think it needs to understand and ought to have understood way before. And hopefully with the belief that once facts are presented, then they will run out of excuses to say, hame ye pehle pata hi nahi tha. Ab to pata chal gaya, ab kya kar lenge, dekh lete hain. Perhaps that is the gauntlet I am throwing at my own community. That now you can't say, our history textbooks never taught us. It's okay. Now we have other material. People who are taking time out of their lives to actually present this material before you. What are you going to do with this literature? How is it going to translate to decisions at the personal level and the collective level is for you to decide. What kind of questions are you going to ask of your elected representatives to ensure that there is no concession whatsoever as far as your civilizational interests are concerned? And how do you get the job done? These are the kind of questions that I would expect and perhaps request platforms like Prabodhan Manch to engage with. So that apart from showcasing the work of individuals, it also translates to creating a corpus of information and opinion so that there are workable and deliverable goals to work towards. The time has come for that. Once you read the ninth chapter, and this was a calculated intent on my part, that people will finish reading the ninth chapter and leave the book the same way they left after watching the Kashmir Files. It so happened that, fortunately, during the course of the writing of the book, I happened to watch the Kashmir Files. And when I came out, I know what my condition was. Not despair, but very clear purpose. In the sense that tail lane again politically correct labels. <laughs> I don't care for labels anymore. Go ahead, call me a fascist. Go ahead, call me a savarna fascist. Go ahead, call me a bigot. I will do a wishpan comfortably. I have developed the thick skin. God has made me fat enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> and in this, I am drawing lessons from two people, both of whom are perhaps polar opposites in terms of their historical positions and the roles that they performed. One is Sri Aurobindo, who effectively said, Hindu leaders must ever, never suffer from this disease called Chakshulajja. Which is that you will never use, or you will never dilute a position simply to say, Log kya kahenge? It's okay. The other person who actually practiced it properly, apart from the revolutionaries, of course, was Muhammad Ali Jinnah. He really didn't care for any Mahatma legacies, nothing. At all. Suffered from no such complex that he was in direct communion with God. Had no notions of being... Uh, of getting dreams at the dead of the night to change the venue of the, uh, of the talks or whatever it is. That's how some of the Khilafat agitations and their venues and dates were changed. Sri Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi woke up one fine day and told Rajagopal Achari, you know, God is basically telling me iski date ko badal dete in terms of when Khilafat day will be observed. I'm a believer. I have belief in all of these things. I'll say this even shamelessly. I don't have a problem. I don't need to be ashamed of any of my beliefs. But what I'm trying to say is, what have you done to the community at the end of it? I really want to know which God was telling you all of this. Was it my God or the other side's God? <laughs> which deity was speaking to you? I'd like to know. Did you also go and pray in a cave for 40 days? So the point I'm trying to make is, you have so much to learn from the other side as well. And the man single-handedly carved out what he wanted for his people, whether he was driven by political interest or self-interest or whatever incentive, I don't care. He got the job done ultimately. And therefore, that's the only thing that matters at the end of the day. Impact, impact, and impact, and nothing else. Words are useless. 
Symbolism is useful only to a certain point, which is to inspire confidence. But if it doesn't translate to concrete political initiatives or policy initiatives, then the Pied Piper is walking us in a particular direction. And if the timelines of the past are anything to go by, assuming that the same time scale and pace applies, you're looking at 24 years, which is very, very conservative, or optimistic in fact, not conservative. If not, you're looking at 15 years. So what are you looking at? I leave it to the intelligence of the audience. What do you make of it? So perhaps when you read this book, a personal sankal to lehi lije, which is to say that you will never be shamed in your office spaces or in your family circles or on social media for holding the position in favor of your community. Civilizational intransigence and lack of moderate accommodating position is the need of the current hour. This is war time. It's not peace time. If you are lulled into believing it's peace time, no, it's not. It's, this is now a different phase altogether where you're looking at a war of slow war of attrition. It's a slow burn war. The other side has already announced it. It's just that you don't think of it as a formal declaration. I don't know what more you need in terms of being given a wake-up call. Now, your personal name will be a little bit of a fatwa. You have put a notice on it. This municipal corporation is a little bit. He'll come finish the job and go. Or sometimes even she will come and finish the job and go. So, sharpen your priorities. I'm not asking you to be uncivil about their expression, but be firm and clear in what you expect. Of course, this is going to translate to multiple tangential, uh, let's say, red herring questions. Are you therefore saying we should look for political alternatives and all that? This is not a political discussion, this is a civilizational discussion. So don't reduce it to a political discussion. Understand what is the central issue that's being raised. Politics is the art of getting a civilizational job done. It is a medium, it is a sadhana and nothing beyond. Whatever they may be in power for is secondary to me. What I want them to be in power for is my primary priority. And therefore, push the agenda ruthlessly each time you're expected to press the button in anybody's favor. 2024 must lead to at least two important outcomes. And that must be reflected in anyone who's batting for us in their electoral manifestos. Temples, under any circumstances. <laughs> Addressing illegal migration on a war footing. That coupled with a serious expression of intent on the Places of Worship Act and the Waqf Board. Thank you. Thanks, Saeedipik ji. Uh, friends, like I said, there are a few questions which have already come in, which my team has helped me curate. I will start with those. But I'm sure with this very, very thought-provoking initial comments that Saeedipik ji provided, I am sure a lot of you have many more questions. Uh, so please uh, feel free. Our volunteers are in the aisles. You can send them uh, the questions you have. And let me start with the first one. Uh, and it's a very, uh, I guess, um, very cliched one because, you know, I think you've said that the Ganga Jamuni Tehzeeb. Uh, <laughs> uh, I need because you, my energy can't be contained. Okay, that. fine. Uh, you can. <laughs> I will. I will. I'll, I'll try <laughs> it's the incurable rogue of a lawyer. <laughs> so, um, I think you refer to the Ganga Jamuni. Tehzeeb as a fiction uh, yes. created uh, to show a syncretic relationship. Yes, yes. Now, if that's a fiction, um, what's your view of the 
base case, worst case, best case between the two communities in India? So, I'll tell you how this creature came to be created. There is an element of truth, but the causal factors which are being imputed to it are flawed. Ganga Jahami Tahzeeb is not the product of a, of a foreign religion's ability to coexist. It is the product of the convert Hindu, his inability to give up his cultural roots. <laughs> Language, Naryal Purna, Diya Jalana, is not the sign of accommodation of the outsider. It is the sign of passive resistance of the insider for a few generations until it, that is completely scrubbed off his Atma. So I'll give you an example from a different society altogether. After the Arab conquest of Persia, why did Iran or Persia become Shia and not Sunni? How did that even happen? It should have led to sunification of the particular country. How did it become a Shia country? Because if you look at, let's say, Africa, Latin America and all these places, every community has its own way of resisting that particular imposition. And they find either local ways of resistance or, let's say, outside ways of resistance, which is, if there is no way I can escape conversion, I'll find something to counter the mainstream within. And there were two pillars of resistance in Persia denomination and language. So therefore there was an insistence on Persian and which is exactly the legacy of the Safavid empires and subsequent empires and there was an insistence on Shiafication of the community. They saw that as their way of resisting the imposition of the Arab. Which is why at every possible opportunity when even Humayun and Babur kept running away to Persia, Madad Dedo, Madad Dedo, they said Shia Bandav De Denge. That's exactly was the olive branch of the term offered to them. 100% will support you. Umma, chumma, everything done. But you will effectively convert to the Shia denomination. That much is very clear. Similarly, if you go to, let's say, Africa, they try to protect those non-religious aspects of their culture in the face of Abrahamic onslaught from both sides because effectively the entire continent is the battleground for these two colonialities. Bharat is effectively going through the very same experience. It's a question of the in inherent spiritual strength and other strengths of this particular community that you have still survived in larger numbers. That is never given credit to. So the subscription to the 12 -er Shia denomination by the, let's say, the, the Persians was in fact a matter of resistance. So Ganga Jamani Tehzeeb effectively shows for a few generations that the convert is unable to give up his actual love for Mother Ganga and for everything associated with it. And how that is scrubbed off his consciousness is captured from the birth of the Wahhabi movement, not in the Middle East, but in the heart of Bharat. So around 1998 and 2000 onwards, uh, that was the time when Readif.com was still a great portal for fantastic articles being written on national security and whatnot. In fact, all the current, uh, let's say, greats like Mr. Rajiv Srinivasan and everybody else, they used to write for Rediff.com in the 90s. That when the internet boom was happening, these, this, this was the kind of literature that I was actually having access to. I remember from my memory of those days that the talk of the sudden Wahhabification of Indian Muslims was, was being aired, as if it's the product of sudden infusion of Gulf money. But when you read the literature, you will realize that this particular facet of that particular community has existed for over 250 years here and has played the central role in the creation of radical Islam in this part of the subcontinent. Now, whether radical is needed or not, I'll leave it for the audience to decide. Now, therefore, the point I'm trying to make is the direct correlation between the establishment of the Wahhabi power center and the creation of the Taliban has been spoken of by Pakistanis. I've cited them in this book. Aisha Jalal in her book, The Partisans of Allah, specifically points to this as to how the Haqqani network and the Taliban network is directly a product of the mosques set up by the Diobandis and others. Their seminaries. I think around 
2011 or 12, I had the opportunity to visit a particular cantonment because a friend was working there. And he confirmed all of this. This was, of course, not confidential information. This was already out and being spoken. It just so happened that the mainstream media was not capturing it because it's uncomfortable, unsecular reality to realize that Wahhabi Islam is not an imputation from the Middle East, but is the Paidawar and the Paidash of Bharat. That the progenitor of this particular mindset, Abdul Wahab and Shah Waliullah Dehlavi studied Hadith in Arabia at the same time from the same teacher is what I'm trying to establish here. And therefore they were contemporaries. It just so happens that because the Wahhabis were attacking British ports in Jeddah and other places in, in Arabia around that particular period, Wahhabism had suddenly become part of the parlance and therefore that parlance was used here. To say that there is a similarity in mindset between the two sects or let's say the two groups in Bharat as well as in the Middle East, so let's call them Wahhabis. Otherwise, the Wahhabis of Bharat were actually called the followers of tariqa e muhammadiya the path of Muhammad. This is the actual name of the Wahhabi movement in Bharat. And how there is a continuous line, every institution that is set up. So the map has been selected on the cover page for that reason. To say each of these institutions located here trace their origin to the central institution in Delhi. So, according to me, the Ganga Jamni Tazib is, even if it existed, a matter of past. And where it exists, it exists not because of the accommodation of another faith, but because of the inability to give up something and perhaps the the, the resilience of the native to a significant extent. And that credit must go back to Hindu dharma and nobody else. Now, coming to the second part of your question, what do we do next? I think we are hoping that economic incentives will do the job. I'm not sure it's a particularly great SWOT analysis. Because I don't think it helps to be, do, be so desperate to look for secular reasons and secular solutions to a religious problem. Then the goalpost is being shifted. And if you think it is going to lead to empowerment in a positive sense and the ability to assimilate and coalesce, well, the, the best of terrorists in this country come from well-funded Saudi countries or let's say Middle Eastern countries. It's not as if economics has made a difference to them. The reason that this must be traced to a particular mindset is because in certain portions of the book, I capture their own words. Allow me to say this, and everything that I'm going to say is lawful and legal, so I'll say it, and with basis. Shah Waliullah Dalevi effectively believed that the advent of his faith is for the destruction of the entire global world order as it exists. And the means to actually achieve that particular end is jihad. This was his clear position. Now he lived in the mid 18th century. Maulana Ala Maududi, Abu Ala Maududi, who was the one who advised Ziaul Haq towards greater sharification of Pakistan, believed in the very same thing. And it's no surprise that the rise of Taliban and the rise of this man to power and Ziaul Haq's regime all coincided. And his very clear position was to say that there can be a separation between the mosque and the state and that Christian style secularism is possible in Islam itself is haram. Everything is governed by it because it is seamless and never ending. Therefore, until that ultimate objective is achieved in terms of destruction of the world order and its recasting in Islamic mold, this will be a perpetual conflict. And that is, according to me, the founding DNA of Pakistan and everybody else who believes in the idea of Pakistan. You cannot negotiate here. I wish there was room for negotiation. The only way that this can be dealt with is in the very language that it understands and whatever that language may be. 
and the ones who are following this path at this point and doing so successfully, unfortunately, these are terrible examples to draw inspiration from. Eastern Europe and China. Terrible examples. I say this myself. But they are the only ones who seem to be able to contain this particular beast. Either through stringent policies on border controls, which they unabashedly defend even on BBC, or the clear position of countries like China, of Russia. The problem is since Bharat is essentially democratic in its spirit, it struggles to emulate any of these models. There is no doubting it and I am not going to hold this against Bharat for it. You may have the conviction of China but whether the Chinese model works for you is something you have to ask because that model is always on the verge of implosion because of the pressure that it creates. It's like a safety, it's, it's like a pressure cooker that can explode any time. There are no safety valves. Ask anyone who is a student of free speech jurisprudence, any Supreme Court, whether in the United States or Bharat, both effectively being the same because we look up to them, is that we say the reason why free speech is necessary is because when a person doesn't have the ability to change policy or to get things done the way he wants to, the only vent that the common man or the common person has, to put it in Justin Trudeau's language, is free speech, the ability to shout and vent and rant. That is one of the roles that is performed by free speech, which is the safety valve. So democracy is contained oligarchy where multiple interests are managed as opposed to a limited number of interests. And you are given the belief that you are in this delusion. How was the Rajya Sabha created? Why was the lower house created? How the language of lower house and upper house was created, you should actually uh, read in portions of the book, I've captured it. Since our geniuses were saying that we must be part of stakeholders, I mean, we must be stakeholders in policy making, legislative policy making, they created, let's say, certain uh, electoral constituencies or certain elective components. Otherwise, previously it was indirect election, they changed it to direct election gradually. But to ensure that ultimate veto and power making, let's say, decision is in a body of bureaucrats, the upper house was created. The chamber of princes and so on and so forth. So that the wielders of power continue to have the veto. Power is not in getting things done. Power is ensuring that your no has a value. Which is to say, if I say no, that's the end of all your discussion. Chintan mantan ho gaya, it's over. The power of veto is the true value of power. Which is to say, are you the limiting agent in a chemical reaction? Then you will decide the rate of reaction. That's it. And whether it happens or not. And that is captured in the evolution of our bicameral system. Next. So, uh, you know, the creation of Pakistan, you know, one thought would have sort of put to rest this whole thing about two nation theory and hopefully economic concerns would come to the fore. 75 years on, it's just the opposite. Correct. Why? <laughs> because you will vote for free electricity, it doesn't matter to them. <laughs> for another reason, because electricity is anyway free to them. <laughs> when people tried installing meters in Kashmir, after the amendment, don't ever call it abrogation of 370. It's not abrogation. Abrogation means the 370 is not in the statute book. It's not. It exists. So simply call it amendment to 370. It's not deletion, repealment, nothing. It exists in the statute book. It's only been changed. They came and they publicly threw the meters in front of the electricity office. What did the state do? <laughs> Women came and threw challenge. Kya kar liya aapne? <laughs> you go to my part of the city. I am from Bhagyanagar. Urf Hyderabad. <laughs> Here's an open challenge to all municipal corporations across the country. Make your electricity bill collections public and subject to RTI and tell us which areas are paying and which areas are not. We'll draw inference. Aapke priorities hi alag hain. these are at the two ends of the, let's say, the spectrum. 
So if you think it's about economics and, and there's this fond belief in Indians, Pakistan will die, implode, will die, will increase in four, will the four Pakistan will come? <laughs> Each of them an independent actor. And you have multiple states to deal with. The only Pakistan that is acceptable is a Pakistan that is reduced to the status of Gaza, which is it will never have an army or a military of its own. Which means Bharat takes over the country militarily and provides for its strict duties. No other version of Pakistan is acceptable. An independent Pakistan with the ability to actually marshal people to arms cannot survive, cannot exist, should not exist. You can keep dreaming of Akhand Bharat, but this is the way to that. And therefore, this WhatsApp university says, Dekho, POK mein, Azad Kashmir mein, Bharat ke liye naare uth rahe What is wrong with you? <laughs> they are only saying, Hame bizli nahi mil rahe, isliye hum chilla rahe. Aur aapko lagta hai ki tiranga ko pakad ke ro rahe. That is the desperation. You are actually hoping that koi to mil jai us community se, jo humare liye baat karega. That is how loser your position is. Stop this desperation. Your plan A is you, your plan B is you, your plan C is you. This is the one thing you must learn from the world Zionist experience. I'm anyway accused of being a Hindu Zionist, I'm owning it up. And I'm saying that, understand that the essence of Zionism, whatever it may be and its end goals, the one thing that you have to draw is self-reliance. Agar dunya aapke khilaaf khadi ho jaye, do you have the ability to stand up? That is the question that you should ask yourself to protect this Punya Bhumi. And therefore, the genuine hope is that you start move, and this has to start from the society. And then the state acquires that character because the Atma of the state is the society. If the Atma thinks that it has to constantly look to the West on either sides of the Atlantic for help, then the state will continuously do the same thing. Fortunately, the state's DNA has changed over the period, over the last 10 years or it's eight years at the very least. But that's because the society has started moving in that particular direction because they realized, agar yehi hal chalta raha, this country will be up for wholesale sale. Next. So, uh, there's a general belief that uh, the overall Hindu civilization in India has withstood foreign invasions and still retained its identity, etc. Is that a, a part of a solution or is that a part of the problem? I think uh, it's a source of hope it is certainly a cause for despair when you also don't realize the flip side to it. See, there are very few countries which have managed to retain their traditional political boundaries. Germany has lost some, France has lost some, Israel has lost some, everybody has lost some. Usme koi doubt hi nahi hai. So I'm not looking at it that way. But you will be comfortable with this particular analysis if you believe that it is just another territory. But if you believe it's sacred geography, which is part of your rituals on a daily basis, then that geography has no business being anybody else's hands. That's one. Second, the history at least of the last 1200 to 1300 years is continuous seizure of Hindu political and civilizational space. Akhand Bharat stops at Pakistan. Why does it not have Afghanistan? I don't understand. It should have Afghanistan because the Shahi dynasty was the last to fall before Kabul fell to the Muslims. So we have given up Afghanistan even in our hope. Pakistan ki umid karte hi ho, Afghanistan ki kyun nahi bhai? So in my view, this, in fact, uh, given the kind of archaeological excavations being done in that place, it's unbelievable that it doesn't form part of even the greater Bharat identity. So what China has done over the centuries is that it has effectively decided that the southern belly, which has all the river systems and that's where the bulk of the population is, is treated as the core bhumi that needs to be protected and it has created buffers around that particular place. Which is to say, agar ye bhi gaya, dosra hai, agar ye bhi gaya, dosra hai, agar ye bhi gaya, dosra hai, ye core to bacha rahega. And therefore you have the annexation of Mongolia, you have the annexation of Tibet and then all of these places they keep annexing so that if you actually look at the original, let's say, map of China before Tibet and Mongolia, it's almost comparable to Bharat and at best it would be, so it's what, about 96,000, sorry, 96 lakh square kilometers, we are about 33 lakh square kilometers. This is after all these annexations. 
otherwise it would be probably even comparable to uh, perhaps maybe so australia is smaller than brazil brazil is 85000 so 85 lakhs this must be about 72 lakh square kilometers australia it's closer to that close to 20 lakh square kilometers is actually an x to protect the buffer so you might as well decide what are your non negotiable areas and then start creating buffers and that would be the concept of greater bharat that is how a greater bharat identity is created so from Aryavarth to the south is to be protected 100%. So whatever is described in the Vishnu Puran or Vishavar Puran, you say, no, from Himalayas to this is mine. But this is also the reason why the Himalayas is the subject of this huge contestation because your identity as a Hindu comes from the Himalayas. Your spirituality comes from that particular place. No wonder the north is the battleground. Assume for a moment that Himalayas are completely outside your hands. What are you really praying to? I mean, your deities are there. That's the belief. If you talk to people who understand the battle that's going around the Himalayan region from the east as well as the west, they are very clear that there is a larger game and we are constantly stuck only with, let's say, the China-Pakistan angle. You don't realize that this would ev effectively mean evisceration of the territorial moorings of your cultural identity completely. That is exactly why Afghanistan doesn't feature in your Akhand Bharat map anymore. And that will happen in the future if you continue to let this happen. So, uh, as they say, generations are shaped by the education system. Yes, and uh, is there, therefore, a case for a fundamental relook at the education system, uh, a need to go back to the Gurukul system? Uh, your views on how that could help us in the end game? Assume for a moment that the government suddenly grows a conscience and says, Gurukul Tathastu. Let's do that. How many in the audience would want to go to a Gurukul? That too is a question to be asked, right? Because we want modern education. Of all the comments that I receive, apart from the hate mail, of course, the positive comments focus more on my English. So sad. <laughs> it, that is equally sad. Then it defeats the very purpose of this coloniality that I keep pushing, pushing, pushing and crying endlessly. Which is perhaps why I have to start training myself in Indian language so that you stop focusing on English and something else. So, I do believe, see, this much is, is, is a banal, hackneyed and obvious statement to make that a society perpetuates its culture only through education. Every society has done that. And therefore, if you seed space on education, you're effectively seeding space on the future. That's where the investment is done. And that's where the investment has happened over 270 years. No wonder we are where we are. So that's the place where you start. I think that's a fairly obvious statement to make. I'm saying that assuming that the government actually decides to do it, how many of us would want to go to a Loretto convent versus DAV are questions we need to start asking. What are the choices? It's not as if there are no Hindu schools, by the way, at this point. There are Chinmaya missions. There are institutions run by Mata Amrita Andamai. There are multiple institutions. How many people would treat that as the first option? What is the badge of honor that you'd want to tell among your family members and your peers? Next. Uh, so I think there are a lot of us, and I, I'm, I'm really encouraged by the younger participants in today's audience. But one of the questions is that, you know, they're not really, as one would brand them as a leftist or a liberal. At the same time, when the discussion goes a bit religious, they are equally uncomfortable. Yes. Uh, so when you talk about creating the Ram Mandir, for example, their first reaction is, don't we need more hospitals, correct? Yeah. So how is it that you get to this, this group of people? Because, as I said, they're not leftists, they're not liberals, and they're, they're your view. That means fundamentally you have not understood your faith system and the value of a consecrated energy space that is accorded to it. This is something that is at the heart of it. And what does that also tell you? That religion is an ornamental vestige in your daily life. And it makes, let's say, perfunctory uh, appearances during festivals. Beyond that, it has really no value. And at best, it is an identity marker on a certificate. It may have some value, hopefully in some families still when it comes to social transactions such as marriage. But even that is on the way out. So, So, Everybody is equal. Sabhi same hai. What is that line? Ekam sat, vipravadanti. 
and the next one vasudeva kutumbakam embrace all this give up what is yours <laughs> how do you use a dharmic saying against the protection i mean survival of dharma only hindus can do this <laughs> so uh, despite my disagreements with a lot of people i think my red pills or whatever or maybe going by my complexion black pills are basically not for others it is for our own people pehle aap jaag jao sab theek ho jayega baaki unko jagrut karna band karo apne parivaron ke andar jhank ke dekho you will lose your civilizational space taluk by taluk and ward by ward not by state by state you will start start losing it first in municipal elections baaki sab baad mein hoga and tab ja ke aapko lagega oh my neighborhood has changed oh maybe i'll have to leave the place oh the path to my place is deliberately strewn with meat for a particular reason oh i can't even say jai shri ram anymore थोड़ा थोड़ा करके संकुचित होता जाएगा आपका जो स्पेस है एंड देन यूल रियलाइज वॉट डू दिस देर इज अ वेरी फेमस सेइंग इन तमिल सागर ऐसा मतलब शंकरा शंकरा विच मीन्स वन यूर डाइंग देन यू थिंक ऑफ शिवा सो देर इज अ लॉट दैट कैन बी डन एट द लोकल लेवल एट द फैमिलियल लेवल फर्स्ट try strengthening that unit first hinduize the family unit first then the larger macrocosm will automatically take the hindu shape i have said this at least for the last 3 years the central unit that dharma pays attention to is the family that is the unit that is currently under on- onslaught from multiple places one there is a concerted let's say onslaught from the outside but it is also contributed to by your own neglect and apathy maybe strengthen that unit in in every way possible and hence my sampradayik argument that the most proximate identity that comes closest to your religious identity is your immediate sampradaya at least try and preserve your sampradaya hindu dharma will automatically survive because it is an agglomeration of all these sampradayas <laughs> next <coughs> so uh, you know there is two points which i would like you to address one is 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 the core maybe resurgence of hinduism a little bit steamrolling some of the smaller subsects as we know them you know jain sikhs etc and on the other hand is it just a uh, issue with the muslim uh, community that you mentioned or the dharma that you mentioned but do you see the papal christianity proselytism was much more from there where do you see these two aspects coming up now the protection of the core identity will strengthen the sikh identity and the jain identity because notwithstanding perhaps any doctrinal differences or darshana based differences that you may have coexistence has always been made possible by the concept of samvad within the hindu fold or the dharmic fold the loosening of the hindu identity is also perhaps the reason for the rapid proselytization of punjab and the dehinduization of the sikh pant is also perhaps the reason for its rapid decline into christianity i went to amritsar i think in 2019 early 2019 the most sacred spot for the sikh panth plast i mean posters after posters plastered across the city of healing sessions across the city people are worried about tamil nadu and people are worried about andhra pradesh worry about punjab because it's a border state which contributes heavily traditionally to your armed forces that's where the serious problem is so drugs and proselytization water lethal combination to finish off such an important community and its hindu identity in one particular chapter where i deal with the case for communal electorates i s- deal with what was done by the madras colonial government to support the dravidian movement to the detriment of hindus in tamil nadu and i also focus on how in the mid 1900s is when the the cleaving of the hindu identity and the sikh identity begins including representations approach to scripture and what not i have given let's say uh, 
pointers for the future for me to research itself in two paragraphs, specifically identifying the journey. Both are very, very crucial. So pay very close attention to Punjab. You cannot leave that state to Khalistanis and to their political representatives sitting in Delhi under any circumstances. Since 2014, in the Delhi High Court lobby, we have been hearing of multiple visits by Khalistanis to leaders of a particular so-called movement at that point who were funding heavily because a new political movement was taking birth and therefore the investment had started at least since 2013. This was before first Modi government. Those who had joined that particular movement with a lot of idealism walked out saying, we are, I mean, we are absolutely scared of the kind of people we are sharing space with here. Normalized visits of previously taboo parties to fund reflected in the, the so-called tractor parade on the 26th of January 2021. That is a direct consequence of 2013. So Punjab cannot be lost. I hope the stars align in some way and Punjab finds its own Annamalai. Uh, a little more on the question on how do you see the issue of the Christian uh, sort of spread of the religion, the, the whole uh, attempt that they've had because they were in power for so long. So, uh, in the first book, I think I've fairly uh, given the literature to show that while the East India Company, thanks to its mercantile interests, was slightly more reticent about pushing Christianity in their official resolutions as directors of the company, they clearly said, we will bring the truth of, or let's say, the gospel of, of, of uh, Jesus to Bharat. East India Company says so as much in its official resolutions as board of directors, they said this. And that's how the education policies were uh, crafted. But once the crown takes over in 1858 after the Sipa mutiny, the, they make a statement, I think, on the 1st of November, 1858, the Queen uh, Victoria specifically says, we will protect your native rights as much as possible. But it is after that statement that missionary activity increases and explodes in Bharat. So lip service is paid so that there is an official document that captures your so-called official position, but then the push begins. And that has been going on. On this, I have extracted Syed Ahmad Khan's own grievances against Krishna uh, missionary activity as part of the second book, where he clearly says, I'll tell you what he says and ask, and ask yourself if this is happening currently or not. Bible-toting individuals will walk to people on public squares and say, this is the true God. Convert. The church will help you. Military officers would tell their subordinates that we will take care of your children and their education, English education, we will give them access to all of this. This would happen. And since English was treated as the pass-through filter to enter the colonial establishment, English education became the medium through which conversion would start. Over four pages, I'd say four to five pages in the book, I've extracted his own statement of what was happening around his period. Everything that he said in the 1850s is, what is happening in 2022. And continues to happen in 2022. In coastal Andhra Pradesh, where Telugu education has been done away with, and Odisha is the next, uh, let's say, place because Jagannath Puri is there. The beach behind the Puri temple is supposed to be known as Svargadwar, which has its own sanctity. Some people are pushing for converting them into bikini beaches and hopefully starting casinos there. For the purposes of tourism, both Himachal and Uttarakhand are called Dev Bhumi, Dev Bhumi, Dev Bhumi. They want casinos in certain places. So, secularization is the path to Christianization has been my learning through history. Uh, slight uh, change, but patriotism in India is, is, is a little emotional concept and, and somewhere between 
nation first, religion first, and emotion versus intellect when it comes to patriotism. Your take on this? There is no desha without dharma. I don't believe in irreligious nationalism. <laughs> Last night I was asked this very question in Pune when someone said, uh, citing the hijab controversy and all of that, that why can't we subscribe to just nationalism? Just nationalism. I said, what is this just nationalism, bhai? Tell me what is it based on. And I specifically said that the new version of nationalism that is being pushed on the other side because they know that nationalism is here to stay is civic nationalism. Which means you will define your nationalist positions on the basis of your allegiance only to the constitution and nothing else. While everybody else will subscribe to their books and will continue to treat those books as being superior to the constitution, we will be the only one subscribing to the constitution. How smart a move is this is for the Hindu community to decide. <laughs> Reorient your positions on the hijab controversy. I don't think it makes sense to ask them to give up the headscarf. Rather insist on your visible symbols being allowed in every place, including in minority institutions. If a student in a minority run educational institution is anyway going to be exposed to their subjects and they don't have the option of opting out of certain subjects, at the very least they must continue to wear the shields that retain their roots, which is the tilak or the bindi or whatever it is. So stop looking at imposing your fate on others, which is deracination. Look for ways to get back what you have lost. Reclamation is what you should be looking at. And even in educational institutions, I think fortunately in the south, uh, especially during the Sabarimala season, any school that stops a child from walking into the school uh, wearing the black clothes, which I used to when I used to observe it, uh, it gets a proper treatment from the parents. Coating one, coating two, coating three, they get it properly. I hope this becomes a lesson. The problem is, you see, there is a very weird mix uh, in the north of India. Lot of religiosity, despite historical experience. And it contrasts with uber secularization. Both somehow coexist. And the fight of Bharat at this point is of the elites of the northern part of the country trying to impose their notions of culture on the Hindu minded non elites. So hence this notion of the Khan market gang effectively dictating the terms for everybody else. If the North manages to win this particular battle of mindsets, two things will be addressed. The North-South divide will automatically come down. Because I see a cultural continuum. And two, the bulwark which has effectively shielded the South has been the North will once more revive itself and protect itself. Yes. How uh, many more questions are we taking, sir? Uh, I think we have another 10, 15 minutes. So okay, sure. It. I and thought 10, 15 questions. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I know you said that uh, it's not about politics and it's not about uh, political parties, but in today's dispensation, uh, the two names which always come up is the RSS and the BJP. Yes. Uh, where do you see them in this what, a battle, fight, protection of the Hindu Dharma? Okay, so. I won't talk about the present, I'll talk of the past. Let people draw their inferences. So, uh, Congress was asking for Hindu Muslim unity, Hindu Muslim unity. Lala Rajput Rai was effectively saying, first you forge Hindu unity. There is never going to be Hindu Muslim unity. So protect your community first, because they're already united. And they're already asking for concessions from the British government because they want the British to stay in power so that the Hindu doesn't reclaim state power. That's their strategic alliance. And both of them say in their respective talks that we are people of the book. We are Ahle Kitab, both of us, and therefore we need to ally. They say this as much. The British man says this in his parliamentary debates and Sayyid Ahmad Khan says this to both the Christians as well as the Muslims of Bharat, saying you must start interdining uh, events with the Christians so that you forge an alliance. Around that period, Congress was desperate to say, we too are representing Hindus, oh sorry, Muslims. So don't form a separate Muslim party. We are the big church, pun intended, for all ideas. 
okay and therefore we will accommodate everyone when they were being accused of being a hindu party they actively said we are not at all a hindu party we are a nationalist party of moderates look at the the confusion within and until the khilafat swami shraddhanand supported khilafat until the khilafat shri tilak supported khilafat and khilafat went on for four years after his demise in 1920 effectively paving the way for gandhi and that's where the non cooperation movement the nagpur assembly everything starts shankaracharya of sharda peet supported khilafat there are photographs of that he was arrested along with the ali brothers for supporting the khilafat everybody learned their lessons after the impact of the khilafat which is why the sangathan movement translates to hindu mahasabha then rss so on and so forth from 1925 onwards and that's what the third book will effectively focus on how the hindu sangathan movement realized what was going on and then changed its position so while i certainly believe that shri tilak was one of the leading lights there is no doubting it gandhi is disproportionately blamed for adopting the khilafat he certainly benefited from it and he magnified it but he did not start the support for it i say this as someone who is a virulent opponent of gandhi on several issues when khilafat was being supported in 1914 because it starts along with the first world war 15 16 gandhi was a nobody in the congress he starts acquiring position only from 1917 onwards because until then the home rule movement is at its peak and the home rule movement is led by two people shri bal gangadhar tilak and ani besant gandhi was nowhere in the picture as long as tilak was in the fore and how representations were made to the british government that these spies brothers the ali brothers must be released from jail is captured in congress's resolutions and these are the words of shri tilak so perhaps this book is an exercise in reassessing everybody who we know or we think we know next so <coughs> i think moving in terms of looking forward now and i yes. think uh, amongst the big changes that have i hope that answered the question on present organizations <laughs> we don't have hindu parties at this point <laughs> so is the uniform civil code one or a possible solution it is a possible solution if the uniformity is based on hindu succession laws as i have said before i am not open to any concession as far as my sampradayas and my personal laws are concerned and i am not going to turn one cheek so that the other fellow can be slapped twice or vice versa i am not interested in that i am at this point only interested in protection of what belongs to me if they don't want to give rights to their women not my problem at all tum apne aap lad lo jo karna hai kar lo mujhe usse koi fark nahi padta it doesn't make a difference to my life i am not in the business of saying that i will reform you i will reclaim what is mine i don't need to reform you i don't wish to do that at all under any circumstances because it's been a failed project across the world it's been an utter failure and i don't think bharat can say that i will do what others have not done in this particular regard i don't think that's going to happen especially given the experience that you've been put through it is not the burden is not on you the onus is not on you so please don't import white guilt and foist it on hindus we are not in that in the same realm the constant comparison in new york times that the muslims of this country are the same as the african americans unbelievable nonsense that's peddled and people here even buy that lo- nonsense lock stock and barrel so don't do that you focus on what is yours and keep that focus unchanged and un- un- let let it never be deterred let that clarity never ever abandon you this generation needs to do that because this according to me is the do or die generation we are on the crossroads so whatever decisions we take now will affect not just us but the next two generations if at all they continue to survive as hindus so you need to be able to stand your ground now very very seriously be intransigent about it next so uh, i know we have a some four uh, two three activities to complete and you have a packed day so two more questions but very important ones from my perspective yes uh, your 
your first, your trilogy is to really educate us or educate people about the constitution its history and what it is but a fundamental question is it time to look for a change in the constitution and if yes how would you suggest we go about it sir i think the time was long ago also i it, it has it has been a crying need at least since i would say the keshavananda bharati judgment which effectively introduced the basic structure doctrine i think around that time we should have revisited it because we were close to 25 years uh, of independence then and uh, or maybe 25 years of uh, the uh, republic coming into existence the point is the flow chart of this logic is crystal clear at least in my head it's not a question of what is permissible in the law it's a question of whether the society as the prime mover is ready for that particular change and does it have the wherewithal to defend all those changes from internal pressures and external pressures if the society is ready then the law will certainly find its way it will happen the preparedness of the society will translate to changes in the law at this point it is not yet ready neither in terms of the will power for it or the clarity for it or the preparation for it therefore this requires at the very least a decades work minimum not by one individual but by a team of scholars across the country working on different aspects of dharma different aspects of constitutional law and combining both these to come out with a hybrid version which allows you to live the contemporary life without losing connection with your past so usually the last question which uh, we ask um, but that's really important because the objective of i think what you're trying to do and what we at prabodhan manch also want to do is really uh, what we call as prabodhan which is uh, evoke thoughts evoke discussion so what as a civil society what as a group of parlekers what as prabodhan manch what should we be doing so uh, last time uh, mistaken for presenting a pessimistic picture every meeting or every book tour the most heartening aspect of it is the youth that turns up and the kind of reading that they have done of the book the kind of story boards and flow charts and let's say uh, let's say uh, the broken down versions of it for public consumption they have come out with the ownership that they have taken through book club discussions instagram discussions is astounding and therefore i'm very very comfortable uh, let's say uh, at least valuing in the notion that i am looking forward to a brighter future i i am a very realistic optimist and my sense of realism based on these first hand interactions which take a toll on my let's say energy levels and my practice commitments is the reward that there is a lot of cause for hope is a serious cause for hope so just don't give up on the next generation i hope that the the demographic mix in terms of the age here continues to change in favor of the future and there are more and more people here so perhaps parlekers might find it in their interest to push their children into participation in these activities and make sure that the presence here of that particular demographic is increased by leaps and bounds that would be the first thing whether you can address or change the history of bharat or not at the very least address the destiny of parle make sure of that make sure that these events are heavily attended by them it goes back with a particular discussion there are let's say discussions on books at home aldim and orthodox outdated brahmin and all that so that fight goes on within the community so it is for us to be able to embrace these causes see it's easy to talk on hijab and all of that how many people especially among the youth would be comfortable discussing the issue of beef and cow slaughter what do they know about the particular subject or on blasphemy these are the hot potatoes which most of us skirt around so when i know for a fact that they realize the reason for the protection of the cow and they're willing to stand behind the particular cause and they understand that while you can certainly bat for free speech you should not put up with devananda beyond a point when the hindu starts saying that is when i think there is a serious cause for hope because right now we are all pujaris of free speech as opposed to pujaris of our devdas thank you thank you so much Uh, so as mentioned in our event publicity uh, 
Jay Sai Deepak Ji just published his book, India, Bharat and Pakistan. The second one in his trilogy on the Constitution. We at Prabodhan Mancha Parle are indeed honored that he chose our platform for the Mumbai release of this book. Sir, requesting you to do the honor. आने वाली पीढ़ी को राह दिखाने वाले एक दीपक को सुनने के बाद आज हम सब काफी प्रबुद्ध हुए दीपक जी प्लीज एक्सेप्ट आर सिंसियर थैंक्स फॉर कंटिन्यूइंग योर जॉब ऑफ नॉट जस्ट एनलाइटनिंग द सोसाइटी बट आल्सो प्रोटेक्टिंग द कोर वैल्यूज ऑफ आर धर्म इन द लॉज ऑफ दिस कोर्ट अ वेरी बिग थैंक यू टू यू सर फॉर चूजिंग विल पार्ले एंड प्रबोधन मंच जस्ट गिव मी टू मिनट्स वाइल आई पुट अप दर्ड ऑफ थैंक्स some housekeeping as well uh, thanks of course to the bmc for the hall tendulkar ji and sai raj publicity for banners and backdrops vastu shobha for stage arrangements avinash paradkar and his team for sound virag vision for videography and anil hardikar of abhutpurva thanks a big thanks to uh, padmanabh acharya ji retired governor for gracing this occasion a very big thanks to the 250 plus contributors of whom like i said 75 have made multiple contributions to us and last but not the least i think what just keeps pravodhan manch going is to see a hall full of people attend us on a sunday morning so please please continue with this great appreciation and continue to attend all our programs uh this time and again i must uh, uh thanks aidipak ji when we did his first program in december uh, 2018 he said since we get a sizable uh, people attending why don't we use the opportunity to also promote certain what i would call good activities this time we have a stall uh, by uh, uh, the people who have created deva bhasha which is a co creation of thought pot and and they've got a stall outside so do visit that stall and in addition of course uh, pre signed books of uh, saidipak ji are available Uh, as you walk outside uh, if you want do purchase them uh, he has a hard stop to leave by 130 so you know for those of you who purchase his books but still want to take a photograph with him you can come back and line up here uh, some of you may have his books and we'll see if we still have time for him to sign them uh, but uh, that would be the next part of the program do try and keep the same discipline that you've maintained throughout today thank you for being here and we will close this with this part with the rendition of vande mataram Vande Mataram, Vande Mataram, Sujana Sukala, Malaya Jashitala, Sasya Shamala Mataram, Vande Mataram, Shubha Jyotsna Pulaki. शोभिनी सुहासिनी सुमधुर भाष